In 1802, a census recorded about 45,000 deaths annually from smallpox. As a young medical apprentice, Jenner encountered the belief that people who milked cows would never catch smallpox, and he never forgot about it. Later, with increased medical knowledge, he formulated the theory that cowpox would give immunity against smallpox. Therefore, when Sarah Nelms, a Barclay milkmaid, caught cowpox in May of 1796, Jenner took some of the lymph from a pustule on her arm and vaccinated a small boy called James Phipps with it. James caught the disease, which was mild, but the great question still remained unanswered. Would James be immune to the dreaded smallpox? On the 1st of July, Jenna inoculated the boy with smallpox, and, fortunately for James, the illness did not develop. Gradually, the practice of vaccination became accepted, but as this cartoon in the style of Gilray shows, the public had some interesting concerns. This garden hut, known as the Temple of Vaccination, was where Jenner performed many of his inoculations. Incredible to think that such a major contribution to world health was made here, when Jane Austen was working on Pride and Prejudice. The two actually had more in common than we might at first think. Both were the children of country parsons, and both applied the principle of careful observation to great effect. More importantly though, were the results of that observation. For Jenna, the potential eradication of smallpox, and for Jane, the immortality of her characters, still continue to earn both of them recognition in the 20th century. For the women of Jane Austen's society, there was a threat to health that was even more common than smallpox, and at every level of society, it was accepted as a woman's lot. We are, of course, talking about pregnancy and childbirth. Although Jane didn't have children of her own, she was well aware of the problems childbearing could cause. Three of Jane's brothers lost their first wives in childbirth, and for two of them it was their eleventh confinement. Whether Jane Austen was a little envious of relations and friends who had children, we can only guess. But some of her sharpest, perhaps even cruel comments, were made about this subject. One poor lady, whose baby was born dead, incited this remark. Mrs Hall of Sherborne was brought to bed of a dead child some weeks before she expected, owing to a fright. I suppose she happened unawares to look at her husband. Jane Austen had some helpful advice about birth control to offer as well, which is interesting when you consider how sheltered her own life was. In one case, she recommends that if all else failed, the couple in question should adopt the simple regime of separate rooms. Jane's nieces were also given some sensible advice by their observant aunt. Fanny Knight received this recommendation in a letter from Jane. By not beginning the business of mothering quite so early in life, you will be young in constitution, spirits, figures and countenance. Another niece, Anna Lefroy, obviously failed to put her aunt's wise words into practice. Anna married in 1814, and by the March of 1817 was expecting her third child. It was certainly quite common for a woman to produce a child every year, so Anna was not doing anything unusual for the time. But Jane, although sympathetic, is a little scathing when she says, Poor animal, she'll be worn out before she's 30. However, before a young lady of Jane Austen's day and social standing could aspire to the delights of motherhood, she needed to get herself suitably married. If we look closely at Jane's novels, we soon discover the major elements governing matrimony had more to do with money than love. This was beginning to change though, and throughout the 18th century, courtship was becoming an important facet of life for young people, who were exercising the right to choose for themselves. The novel developed at this time principally to chronicle this new trend, 
and although some popular authors trivialised the medium, Jane Austen made an art form out of writing about the trials and tribulations involved with aspirations to the matrimonial state. The manners of courtship and marriage were well established, and anyone who flouted these would usually run into difficulty. The code of behaviour was set out to defend a lady's reputation, and when Marianne, in Sense and Sensibility, defies convention, she pays a very high price. Marianne is of the same social class as Jane, so the only option open to her is that of a safe marriage. This letter which Jane wrote before moving to Bath enjoys a joke about the breaking of marital convention, but it does involve females of an inferior social standing. We plan having a steady cook and a young giddy housemaid, with a sedate middle-aged man who is to undertake the double office of husband to the former and sweetheart to the latter. No children to be allowed on either side. As Jane grew older, she evidently became more cynical about men and marriage, and in this letter rates the acquisition of a husband alongside the acquisition of a pair of shoes. Mrs Blount was the only one much admired. She appeared exactly as she did in September, with the same broad-faced, diamond bandeau, white shoes, pink husband and fat neck. Jane Austen certainly had the opportunity to marry, but she chose to remain single rather than marry without affection. The fact that Jane Austen could accept her lot as a single woman had much to do with the early rumblings of feminism that was shaping the female expectations of the time. Mary Wollstonecroft wrote A Vindication of the Rights of Women, which was published in 1792 when Jane was just 16 years old. Mary argued that girls should not be educated purely to attract a husband, suggesting that they'd be better served if they were taught how to be good wives and mothers. This proves that Jane Austen was not the only female of her day who recognised the potential of women if they were allowed to put their intelligence to a use beyond finding a husband. Mary Wollstonecroft eloquently notes that The civilised women of the present century, with few exceptions, are only anxious to inspire love when they ought to cherish a nobler ambition and by their abilities and virtues exact respect. In 1798, Mary died, ironically giving birth to her daughter, Mary Godwin, who would grow up to marry the poet Shelley and write Frankenstein. Unfortunately for the cause of feminism, after her death, Mary Wollstonecroft was discovered to have led an unusual and immoral life having had an illegitimate child as a result of an affair. She was also an atheist, which gave the religious leaders of the day the opportunity to discredit her and her cause. The Reverend Richard Polwell, in an anti-feminist publication, described the sparkle of confident intelligence as being proof of immodesty in a female. Needless to say, the cause of feminism may have been brought to light by Mary Wollstonecroft, but it was also set back by her quite considerably as well. Society was undergoing great change, and even though Mary's behaviour damaged the cause of women's rights, life was changing for the common man. Thomas Paine published The Rights of Man in 1791, which attacked privilege and inherited wealth. He also suggested some pretty radical reforms, old age pensions, family allowances and education for all. The work was dedicated to George Washington, the first president of the United States of America. The American War of Independence grew out of the British government wanting the best of all worlds. On the one hand, they wanted the American settlers to run their own administration, and on the other, they wanted to increase the taxes that the settlers paid, resulting in the famous cry of no taxation without representation. War broke out in 1775, the year of Jane's birth, with independence being declared on the 4th of July, 1776. When we look at the declaration, it is easy to understand why Tom Paine admired the principles behind it and echoed them in his Rights of Man. It stated, 
that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness. The French Revolution, which began in 1789, also did much to reinforce Paine's thinking. The war with Britain, which resulted, was declared in 1792. For nine years the revolutionaries fought hard, but made little progress, until Napoleon became France's leader. With Napoleon as its military commander and emperor, the war continued until the Battle of Waterloo in 1815. Jane Austen was 17 when this war started, and nearly 40 when it ended. This perhaps goes some way to explaining the shortage of good men in her novels, as well as in her own life. Over 20 years at war with France not only caused stress for young ladies in search of husbands, it also put a great deal of pressure on the political system of the day. William Pitt, the younger, was Prime Minister from 1783 to 1801 and 1804 to 1806. He was a Tory who would have enjoyed the support of the Austin family as he championed the cause of the established order. Throughout George III's bouts of illness, he opposed the Regency, remaining loyal to the King. The opposition, the Whigs, were led by Charles Fox, a keen supporter of the Prince Regent. There were some stormy battles between these two politicians, as Fox stood for reform and even supported some of the ideals of the French Revolution. James Gilray did much to raise the public perception of politics with his satirical cartoons, sold as prints and accessible to people of every class in society. Even the illiterate could understand the sting in James Gilray's tale. If politics could be relied upon to provoke a good argument in Jane Austen's day, then so could religion. In Jane Austen's household, the developments affecting the church would have come under much greater scrutiny than the politics of the day, simply because of the family connection. Jane's father, the Reverend George Austen, went into the church after university, just as other young educated men went into the law or the army. The church was a profession which offered stability, and Jane's oldest brother James became a clergyman. When her favourite brother Henry, the entrepreneur of the family, became bankrupt, he fell back on a career in the church, taking over the living at Steventon, the parish of his father and brother before him. Although the Austin clergymen were undoubtedly good men, it was pretty hit or miss as to whether the local upholder of the faith was decent or not. There was also a practice of granting the living from a church to an absentee clergyman who would rarely visit his parish. It was against this background that a new movement was growing throughout the length and breadth of the land. By the end of the 18th century, Methodism and its fiery advocate John Wesley had made their mark. Wesley travelled far and wide, preaching personal salvation through the blood of Jesus Christ. Many people were saved and sent on their way, equal to any man in the sight of God. As far as religion was concerned, God was back, and the established church was very wary of his presence. 